First time using this room. Wait just a minute. Okay, let me pass out. All right. Um, what do we have online? All right, great. Um, so I'll go ahead and just kind of get started with announcements and other things. Let me. All right, so let's just kind of first start off with some introductions and other things, right? So <clears throat> I'm the professor for the course, Shane Yost. Uh, I've been here at Texas State now for four years, or I'm in the middle of my fourth year. Um, I do computational chemistry, computational modeling, electronic structure theory type stuff um, here at Texas State. Um, taught this course once before. Um, trying to kind of adjust the height of this thing here, real quick. And um, going to try to make a few little changes since I've taught it, uh, but also kind of keep something the same. Uh, what else? Yeah, um, trying to get me random kind of bit of information uh, about myself. My office is on the third floor here in this building, right next to Doc, right next to Dr. Rhodes, 309. Um, typically in my office, because as I said, I do computational modeling, so I work with computers. So if I'm doing anything lab, I'm just doing it from my computer and we're moving into the lab here. So, um, that being said, office hours are going to be just done remotely um, via Zoom. So I don't really want anyone else in my office so that I don't have to wear a mask in my office as much. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm not doing any office hours in my office. If you want to chat after class or something like that here, you know, I don't think there's a class here after art, but there might be. I don't know. I'll have to, take a look at that but you know I'm happy to potentially chat in person in a room like this or something else like that you know if you'd rather chat in person instead of just doing it over zoom um that's kind of you but I'm happy to try to make that work um it's my first time using this room and they don't I feel like I want to push this table forward a little bit more but um it is what it is um see and i guess they have these desks marked i don't i don't want to get these rolling desks for this room and then basically tell you keep the desks here you know what i mean but it is what it is. um 
I know for some of you, it's maybe been a while since you've taken physical chemistry. Um, and so, you know, this, this, this course is going to be an overview of a bunch of topics in physical chemistry in some specific areas. We'll dive a little bit deeper into it. Um, other areas will just kind of do a general overview of some things as well. Um, so we'll get more into some of that stuff in a minute. Uh, before I, I kind of go more into details and things in syllabus and things like that, anyone have any kind of general questions about anything, um, uh, you know, about the course myself, um, Canvas website, or other things like that? Um, yeah, so. Right. Uh, we meet Monday, Wednesday in this room or via Zoom if, if you prefer that. Um, right, as I said, I mean, we were covering thermodynamics, kinetics, quantum mechanics, spectroscopy, things like that um, on the course, and, and we'll kind of talk about some more of that with the syllabus. Um, you know, random stuff about honor codes. If you need accommodations, go through the Office of Disability Services. Um, breakdown of of uh, percentage of your grade. So regular exams are 20% or 50% total. Final exams 20. Presentation um, we'll talk about in a minute is 20% and homeworks are 10%. Um, uh, it says tracks that's supposed to be changed to Canvas. Um, right, the homeworks will be posted on Canvas. I'll post the first one uh, sometime today. Okay. Um, Uh, in terms of, so what, why I give the homework is to give people exam, extra example problems, extra practice in preparation for exam. You know, the, the exams will resemble a lot like the homework in terms of difficulty um, and things like that. If, if you know, your, your uh, comfortability, with how comfortable you are or not with math, if, if you're doing the homework and you're having some issues with the math, you know, then come talk to me. The, the homework, the math on the homework will always be as more difficult or as difficult as the exam. The exam will never have more difficult mathematical concepts than the homework. Now the exam could have some uh, extra physical chemistry concepts and things like that. Maybe try to throw a, a curveball in a question of, you know, what would happen if this occurred instead of what, you know, maybe you're used to doing, you know, and, and, and having you talk about that and stuff, you know, so, so the PCHEM topics and concepts might, could be a little bit more difficult um, on exam than on homework, but the math never will be, okay? So, so if you feel comfortable with the math on the homework, then you'll feel comfortable with the math on, math on the exam. Um, and then there's some, some problems on the homework that will have uh, more challenging math um, skills required, then we'll definitely be on the exam. And I'm happy to point those out uh, as we go along in the semester. Um, what kind of grading thing? And there's a Canvas website. If you haven't gone to it already, I've, I've sent out a couple of announcements through it. Um, on there, I'll, I'll have modules uh, set up to organize the different uh, topics that we'll talk about in the class. I'll post lecture slides. I'll put links to the lecture videos on those modules. Homeworks will be linked. So I, I try to have everything kind of related with that topic all in the module. So it's a simple place to go to and you can go from there to, to find the other information you need, right? Um, and say so I'll have all that up on Canvas and fill in the modules as we go throughout the semester. Um, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll, I, I'm, I'm recording these lecture videos uh, or lectures, right? And I will post them on YouTube and then link them on Canvas because Canvas does not have given enough space to be able to post them on Canvas. So, um, so I have, I guess I forgot to put here, right? So, so the YouTube channel is just prof underscore yours, okay? P-R-O-F underscore Y-O-S-T, okay? 
Um, so if you want to search for that, you can find it. Though right now there's nothing posted right on the, on on the channel. I made a oh, what are they called? Like a section for videos. I forget now. But um, right, but but there'll be like a uh, subfolder. Right? I don't think in terms of just regular like picture terms. Uh, huh? Well, not. I don't know if it's channel, right? Like, I mean, like someone's YouTube channel, right? They can have certain like groupings of videos, right? I don't know what those groupings are called again, or what YouTube calls those groupings, but you know. So, so there'll there'll be a, a group that's created for just the the videos from this class. So you can always just go to that group if you want to go directly to the channel. But like I said, the videos will also just be linked on Canvas. So you can always just go through Canvas, click on the link for the specific day of a video and, and watch it. Um, you know, and, and then it'll pull up directly the video which you're looking for on YouTube. If you don't if you want to do it that way. Now sometimes the link on Canvas to YouTube doesn't work. I don't know why. Um, and so sometimes you like click on the link and it says it can't upload this video, and then you gotta like click on something again, and it will then take you directly to YouTube and that specific video. All right, um, so the exam dates are already kind of given. Uh, those won't change. What's on them could change depending on the speed that we get through things, but yeah, as well as the final exam. Um, so there isn't a direct textbook for the class. There's some def couple of references, but I'd say the Atkins and Paula textbook here is the one that's going to most closely resemble what we're going to go over and do this class. Um, so I, I'm going to flip it to this real quick. I will be right back. I hate sniffling and uh, my allergies have been acting up recently. I'm going to go blow my nose because yeah, this is awkward with that. So. Okay, so right, I have kind of a week and a half set up for thermochemistry because I don't know, there's just mainly, you know, I like we're gonna just kind of breeze through some of this stuff. I have a lot of random slides, but we'll kind of see. The main concepts and ideas of thermochemistry I just want to review and reiterate for people is just the idea of Gibbs free energy, spontaneity, entropy. Things like that, and then how that relates to equilibrium and electric chemistry. Okay, um, so that that's really what we kind of want to what we're going to kind of focus on is, is those kind of things. And so that's the the main stuff we're going to highlight here in, in thermochemistry. We're not going to do anything with expansions and compressions of gases and stuff that that you've done in undergrad. Um, not going to worry about any of that crap. We're going to focus on just chemical. Thermochemistry is applies to kind of chemical reactions and things of that nature, right? So, so again, equilibrium, electric chemistry, and other such things. Okay? Um, and then spontaneity of chemical reaction. So that's mainly what we'll talk about with thermochemistry. So that's why I don't plan on spending too much time on that. Kinetics, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on because kinetics, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about just general rate laws and things like that, but, but we'll talk a lot about mechanisms and how, given a proposed mechanism, you can work out um, a rate law and things of that nature, and then how would you test that in lab and stuff, right? So, so again, kind of the topics and things that we'll focus on and dive more into details in, we'll do examples of, of enzyme kinetics and things of that as well, it is 
things I feel are going to potentially, you know, according to myself, and I'm not, you know, uh, you know, the grand the know it all of everything, right? But um, you know, things that I feel are going to be more in, useful and more relevant to you in lab, right? Whether or not the labs are working in now, but potentially in lab in the future, okay? And so, you know, that's why in, in thermodynamics, we're not going to be talking about expansion, compressions of gases very much and things like that. Unless you're doing chemical engineering, you know, some of that stuff isn't as relevant. You know, maybe just talk about reactions and rates and, or, and, and equilibrium constants and electrochemistry and things of that nature. Um, and then in kinetics, again, we'll focus a lot on reaction mechanisms and predicting rate loss from those mechanisms and things of that nature and doing different examples there. Okay. And then we'll jump into to quantum mechanics. We'll spend a little bit of time just kind of introducing the ideas of quantum mechanics and some of the basic concepts. You know, what is the part of the box problem, harmonic oscillator, things like that. And for that, a lot of it is just mainly to, you know, for there, the concepts and ideas we want to get out is just mainly to get out the idea of, you know, what are the guiding principles of quantum mechanics so that we can then apply those and use those for spectroscopy, okay? Um, and we might spend actually more time on spectroscopy than what's marked there, I don't know. Um, but we'll, we'll spend a decent amount of time on spectroscopy and just go over the details and things like that, different types of spectroscopy, rotational, vibrational, electronic, um, you know, uh, direct absorption emission, Raman type stuff. Um, <clears throat> and just talking about all those different things, NMR spectroscopy. And we'll go over all those different things, do examples with them and, and so on. Okay, so we'll be focusing on a lot of that stuff. Because um, <clears throat> that's, that's kind of probably some of the most important concepts uh, potentially out of this class is, is things with spectroscopy. Um, and then you know, because I, I am who I am, we're going to spend some time talking about molecular orbital theory, uh, wave functions of molecules, kind of electronic structure, um, and some concepts and ideas behind that. Again, I don't know if we'll spend as much time what's written there. These are kind of my rough ideas of how long things will take, but, you know, I, I don't really know um, off the top of my head. We'll just kind of see as, as things go. Okay. And then finally, after kind of that, that fourth exam here, um, um, we will um, do presentations. I think two days will probably be enough because presentations, I think, roughly have like 20 minutes per person. Um, but I don't know. Uh, if, 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 if that's not the case, then maybe I'll change around uh, some dates of things or something like that. Because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Things are like eight to 10 people sign up to class. So if it's 10, 10, 20 minutes, what is that? Uh, three three and a half hours ish, um, not quite, um, which is, you know, th three hours is, is how much we have for two days. Um, so, so something like that, um, right? But the, so the presentations, what that's all about, and, and when you get closer to that, I'll, I'll send out some information on it, but essentially what you'll do is you'll pick some sort of um, spectroscopic topic, something that's used in the paper, and talk about that type of spectroscopy that we didn't, and, and not one that we talked in class, right? Um, but but something that we haven't talked about in class um, that that's in some paper it could be related to spectroscopy that's done in the lab you're working in, or spectroscopy done in some lab you're not working, in, right? Um, but just some thing, and then you'll talk about that type of spectroscopy, kind of explain how it works, what you can learn from it, and things like that as well as in going to detail about like a specific example in a paper of where they used it, what information they gained from that spectra and, and, and their analysis and such, okay? Um, and, and so that's kind of what those presentations are about and, and will be on. Um, and again, I'll, I'll have more details about that as we get closer to the end of the semester, as well as a kind of grading rubric so you can kind of see how, how you're graded on the presentations and things like that before you have to prepare for them. And then there will be, you know, final exam it's on that Monday, May 10th, um, from 2 to 4.30. Um, so, yeah, so that is kind of the outline for the class for the semester. Uh, are, there, are there questions people may have kind of just about this, about the course, grading, um, what's do, not do? Whatever things. Um, I guess I didn't put here due dates for, for homework. 
but basically I'll, I'll typically have a homework um I forget how I, I had done this originally um i want to say per exam is i think how i kind of designed it is just my homework for exam but i i'll have to take a look i have to remind myself maybe even say it in here i, I should have looked that up beforehand right um Even mention uh, details about the homework on here. What happened to that? Yeah, okay, no, yeah, that's what I thought. So, in the homework problems, right, right, there will be a homework assigned associated with each exam. So, there should be one homework per exam. Um, and and I'll, I'll put, uh, you know, not to do dates a little bit closer, but Typically, um, you know, the due date will be, say, you know, the Monday before that exam, um, you know, the Monday before, you know, typically the class period before the exam class, okay, is typically when those, those homeworks will be due, okay, um, and so there will be four homework assignments uh, for the semester as well. All right, questions? So just out of curiosity, if, if we can just go around the class just so I have an idea of where, where, what labs people are in and things like that, so if you don't mind um, just you know introducing yourself and, and at minimum just say whose lab you're working in. Um, you know, if you want to give any more information, you're welcome to. But but yeah, so I don't know if we can start here and work our way right. My name's Andrew. I work in the Dr. Michael's lab. Um, I believe we have someone on here. Jennifer, if you don't mind typing out, if you will, just for myself. Yep, Dr. Sherman, okay. Yeah, all right, thank you very much. Um, okay, that, that, that just helps. Again, you know, I, I like to keep that in mind as we go through the semester in terms of structuring things and things like that in terms of what stuff may or may not be more relevant, try to um, you know, reference things back to, to things going on in some of these labs or other things. So, um, okay. So, if there are no questions, kind of about the course and the structure of things, then then we'll go ahead and get started. Good. All right. I again, I need to just like make a timer for myself to keep track of the time. There's a no clock. It's ridiculous. There's no clock anywhere on the wall. Um, so, so I'll say this in 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 general. If as we're going, uh, you know, through the semester and things like that, you know, and I'm going one day and I'm really into something that I'm talking about, and I just won't shut up, and time's about to run out. Feel free to let me know. You know what I mean? I I I, I in no means. I, I'm never trying to make the class run over on purpose. Okay? Um, typically, if we're about to run over or something like that, it's just because I'm not aware of the time. Uh, so, so just keep that in mind and, and feel free to, to, you know, let me know that hey, we we're about out of time or we ran out of time or something like that. Um, okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so as I said we're, we're going to talk, you know, so we're going to introduce some things to get to kind of Gibbs free energy and spontaneity and things to talk about that. And then from there, we'll talk about uh, chemical kinetics and electrochemistry. 
Um, so just as a reminder of things, right? When we when we talk about thermodynamics, um, we'll often talk about our system, our surroundings, and the universe, right? And our system is the thing we care about. It could be a chemical reaction, it could be your entire beaker, it could be whatever, right? A, a set of gases in, in the chamber, right? But that's your system. Um, your surroundings is everything else literally everything else in the universe but your system, right? And the universe is a system plus surroundings, right? And so, right, when we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, system, again, our chemical reaction, we think of the reaction, surroundings, the solution around it, other things, right? And the universe is a combination of those two. Right, um, our type of systems are open systems, right? Where matter and energy can exchange. Closed systems, you can have the exchange of energy, but not the exchange of matter, right? Again, open systems is just like an open coffee mug, right? Closed system is you put a lid on that coffee mug, right? Um, and then isolated systems is some sort of adiabatic um, type boundaries or whatever, right? Your ideal coffee mug that keeps your coffee hot indefinitely for the entire day because no energy transferring out of that coffee, right? Um, would, would be kind of your isolated system. Okay. Um, or T if you're a T. So <clears throat> type of way energy is transferred between systems and surroundings is through work or heat. Work is just an ordered energy transfer, just all molecules moving in the same direction, okay, doing some sort of concerted effort to do something in particular, right? As work, well, heat is just energy, molecules moving in a random chaotic way, disordered transfer of energy. Okay. More often, energy is transferred via heat than it is work. But, um, right, uh, you know, for example, when, whenever you have a chemical reaction taking place, right, there's some net change in, in enthalpy of that reaction, right? That change in enthalpy is going to be associated, um, right, with, with uh, you know, some energy transfer from the system into the surroundings, and let's say exothermic. Well, that energy being transferred is typically just done in the form of heat, right? Just heating up your solution and things like that. Or if it's an endothermic reaction, it would cool off the solution as the reaction goes. Okay? Um, okay. So I'm, I'm kind of breezing through some of these things very quickly, but again, feel free to, to raise your hands or interrupt me or whatever if you have questions about any of this stuff. Um, you know, I'm hoping some of this is a reminder, and I'm just kind of touching on these subjects to remind ourselves. Of just some of these things that we talked about before in PCHEM that you've taken before at some point when you got your bachelor's degree. Right. Um, so, uh, right. So the types of descriptors for our system are things we can talk about. It's internal energy. We can talk about its enthalpy that we'll talk about in a minute. It's entropy, Gibbs free energy, Helmholtz free energy. Right. These are different things that kind of describe something about our system. Okay. Uh, so the internal energy is describing the total kinetic plus potential energy in our system. Okay. Um, some useful things about the internal energy is that it is a state function. Um, this is relevant when we use things like enthalpy as a state function. Things like Hess's law um, right, uh, are, are used because of the fact that internal energy, enthalpy, Gibbs free energy, entropy, these are all state functions, meaning that the the value in our change in internal energy just depends on our initial and final states. And it does not depend on how we get there, right? Again, this is why Hess's law works. Why you can add up the enthalpy change for three different reactions to get the enthalpy change for one reaction, right? As long as those three reactions take you from the same initial reactants, to the same final products, you know that the enthalpy change is the same whether or not you took that long path for the three reactions or did it directly through one reaction. And that is because the enthalpy is a state function, is path independent. Um, and there's some more specific mathematical definitions about having exact differentials and all this other crap. Doesn't matter, we won't get into the class about that. But that property has to do with it being a state function, that it does not depend on the path you take to get to the initial and final state. Okay, it does not matter how I get to those, uh, get from one state to the other, just matters what are my initial and final states, right? And I like to emphasize this related, you know, as a difference to kinetics, right? 
thermodynamics, if you think of it as an energy diagram, right? All right, we have some sort of just rough energy diagram here, uh, right? You know, this is your initial state or your reactants, let's say your products, right? Thermodynamics just cares about this bit, right? In here, and the kinetics cares about all this stuff, right? So thermo, right? Thermo just cares about that. And then kinetics, right? Just cares about the middle part, right? Um, and so, right, and, and that's mainly because most of the things we're interested in in thermodynamics are these state functions that just depend on the initial and final states and not how we get to them, okay? So, right, U being an extensive function of internal energy, extensive just means, right, the more stuff you have, the larger the internal energy is, right? It's all that saying extensive function means it depends on how much stuff you have, right? Which makes sense, right? That, the more gas molecules I have in this room, the more mo more kinetic energy there is, because the more you know molecules that have a kinetic energy are known, right? So, so internal energy being extent function should make some sense, right? Um, and because you use a state function, right, that change in internal energy is just the final internal energy of your system minus the initial. Um, kind of just went over kind of the difference between intensive, extensive, right, size, dependent, or independent state versus path dependent functions. Heat and work are these path dependent functions. Your amount of heat transfer depends on how you did your change in state, right? Amount of work done depends on how you did your change in state. We won't really focus on those things in this class, um, but, you know, this is a reminder. Right, and then some just general, um, you know, information on, on science inventions, right? If energies be transferred to your system, okay? Your system's energy is increasing, it's internal energy increasing, that means energy is being transferred to it from the surroundings. That is a positive change in internal energy. It's a positive change in enthalpy, um, right? Um, uh, and, and, but if you're, uh, right, if you, lost energy in your system and you've given that energy to the surroundings then that's going to be a negative internal energy change a negative enthalpy change right exothermic reactions delta h is negative heat is being transferred to the surroundings right um the same thing with q right um, heat transferred to the system is a positive value heat transferred to the surroundings is a negative value um then work work done by the surroundings is positive right um because because again if the surroundings is doing work that means it's giving up some of its energy into the system, okay? Right, let's say you're compressing a gas that's increasing the potential energy of that gas potentially, right? And so you're transferring energy into the system and that work is done by the surroundings, right? And if the work is done by the system, then that's transferring energy to the surroundings and so it's negative, okay? But again, we won't really focus too much on heat and work um, in this class, but kind of, remind ourselves of those conditions. All right. Um, <clears throat> and we talked about enough to remind ourselves of what is the first law of thermodynamics, and that's our conservation of energy, that the total change in internal energy in our system is just related with the total amount of heat transferred plus the total amount of work done. Okay? Right? Because again, heat and work are the ways in which energy can be transferred. If our internal energy in our system is changing, that means energy had to be transferred from our system to our surroundings or vice versa. Okay? And that's only done through heat and work. And so again, so delta U is just, this is literally saying conservation of energy, that, that the change in internal energy in your system has to be equal to the amount of heat transferred and the work done um, by your system or by the surroundings or due to system. Questions? No. All right. Um, so again, I, 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 I realize that I'm kind of just jumping through 
some of the stuff. And we'll, we'll, we'll do some examples as well. Like in, in the class, we'll, we'll definitely be doing some examples while in class and not just me up here blabbering the entire time. Okay. But again, I, I, I feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, yeah, and hopefully some of the stuff so far has just been kind of a review. Things people have seen, whether or not you've seen it very recently is, is another question, but hopefully you've at least seen it and maybe kind of it's jogging in there, right? So enthalpy, okay. Enthalpy is a state function as well. It's extensive, okay. It's defined as internal energy plus P times V, P being pressure, V, v being volume, okay. That is the definition of enthalpy, okay? Why we care about enthalpy in chemistry is because, um, and we won't show it here, but enthalpy, for basically for chemical reactions, uh, your typical chemical reaction takes place in a constant pressure environment, right? Your lab is at some sort of constant pressure. Your fume hood is at some sort of constant pressure, right? Even if you apply a vacuum to your reaction, it's at that constant pressure of the vacuum, right? So our chemical reactions, typically under constant pressure conditions and the pressure of the system and, and, and the surroundings is typically the same, right? The, pre the pressure in your solution that's on top of the solution is the same in, in the entire, um, you know, fume hood or things like that, right? So, so the pressure in our system, the surroundings are equal typically and they're constant. And that means that given those things that the heat that's transferred from your chemical reaction is going to equal the enthalpy change of that chemical reaction. Okay. Um, so that's why we care about enthalpy typically more than we say do internal energy. Internal energy would require a constant volume condition, right? So if we did our, all of our chemical reactions in, you know, constant volume containers, right, that weren't open to the atmosphere or things like that, then we typically more often talk about the internal energy of those reactions because that would be related with the heat transfer for the reactions, right? Because we can measure heat transfer. We can do calorimetry measurements, things like that. We can measure temperature changes in water, look up its heat capacity and so on, right? So we can get heat transfer for chemical reactions, right? And it just so happens that our typical reaction conditions are in such a way that that heat transfer is equal to the enthalpy um, change for that reaction. Right, so again, the, the note here on the bottom of the slide, right, that the enthalpy change is often thought as heat, okay? This is only true, right, for constant pressure um, situations with mechanical equilibrium to the surroundings, which is what I was describing. But again, that situation happens to occur in basically every chemical reaction we typically do in life, okay? Um, so again, that's why in the end, Enthalpy is something we care about, right? And, and, and that we, we use and um, talk about often in chemistry. Yeah. It's the reason why we talk about Gibbs free energy instead of Helmholtz free energy when you get there as well. Yeah. Um, it's just based off of what are the typical conditions for chemical reactions. So yeah. Um, all right. Um, what, what, Right, we'll, we'll often talk about standard states of systems of our reactants or products or things like that, right? A standard state, as just a reminder, means the pressure is one bar, temperature can be whatever it is, you know, specify that. Concentrations are one molar, right? If you have a solid or liquid, it's pure solid, pure liquid, no homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures, right? And if you're some element, it's whatever its most stable form is at that temperature and one bar pressure, okay, right? So for your halides, right, uh, you know, your, your chlorine, get, chlorine would be a gas, chlorine would be a gas at one atmosphere, one bar pressure, right? But then you get to iodine. I think iodine's a liquid at room temperature, maybe not. Um, I want to say it is, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's not at room temperature, but, right? But, but, but iodine has a, 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 a um, right, a, a lower a boiling point so if it's not room temperature, right, it, it's at a colder temperature, right? But, but um, you know, depending on your element, depends on what its stable form is at, say, room temperature and one bar pressure. Okay. Um, but again, the temperature doesn't have to be room temperature. It can be whatever temperature you specify. But yeah, but standard states just mainly you have one atmosphere, one bar pressure, 
um, and one molar solution, right? Your gases, pressures are one bar, your solutions, concentrations are one molar. Um, yeah, of course. Oh, one molar each, each. So each component in your reaction, let's say, so let's say you're talking about a reaction at, chemical, at standard states, right? Each molecule that consists, that, that is in the, uh, you know, uh, liquid phase, right, that, that's dissolved, each solute is at one molar. So yeah, so not one molar total, that, that's a great question, yeah. So, so it's not one molar total, it's one molar per solute, okay, um, right? Now that that could be one molar per salt. So so let's say we're talking about um, right uh, sodium chloride, right? Um, uh, right standard state for like aqueous aqueous sodium chloride, okay, is going to be um, right. This is going to be a one molar concentration of aqueous sodium chloride, which happens to mean that it then produces, right, if, you know, with this dissolved, this produces one molar of Na plus and one molar of Cl minus, right? Um, and then again, the standard state for, say, um, calcium chloride, right, would be one molar, ugh, right, still be one molar, Right for calcium chloride, but this breaks apart right into one molar calcium ions and two molar chloride ions. Right, um, but you'd be talking about like, yeah, st standard state would be kind of one molar of that, one molar of that type thing. So, um, so yeah, so it it, it kind of depends, right, in terms of you know some things like that, right. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's per kind of molecule, or if you will, right, in terms of each having a concentration of molecule. And the same thing is pressure, right? That the pressure for each gas in your reaction is one bar, okay? Um, not that necessarily the total pressure. Now, if you have like an open container, right? Again, you imagine you're doing this in a fume hood, right? The total pressure in your fume hood is say one bar, right? Each gas, Will, in that fume hood will occupy whatever volume it needs to occupy to have one bar worth of pressure in that fume hood, right? Um, but, you know, the total pressure in the fume hood is still one bar, right? So the total pressure could still equal a pressure for each gas is, or, or something like that. Well, actually, that's not true. You can't have that. You can have the total pressure, then it wouldn't be one bar. Yeah, then, sorry, the total pressure is never going to be one bar. Um, yeah, so no, you, you the total pressure would be the sum of all the partial pressure of gases. I, I didn't say that. But yeah, it, it is one bar pressure per gas in your reaction, right? It's H2 plus Br2 forming two HBr. H2 would have a pressure of one bar. Br2 would have a pressure of one bar, right? Those would be your standard states. Right, and, and this is relevant when we talk about uh, equilibrium. Uh, right, because your equilibrium constants and things like that, um, and the relationship between that and gives free energy um, it, it is related with kind of the standard state versus non standard state conditions. And the Nernst equation, if people remember that from electrochemistry, it, it is essentially how your, um, you know, your chemical potential changes from non standard state conditions, right? Um, okay. And so, so yeah. Um, and so when we talk about then a standard, say, enthalpy change, okay, typically use this superscript zero here, um, right, to refer to the, as the enthalpy change under standard conditions, standard states at some given temperature, okay. So if I wanted to look at the condensation reaction for N2, which is, you know, just a phase change, right, but still I could think of it as a reaction, right, N2 gas going to N2 liquid, right, that has an enthalpy change, standard enthalpy change, right, I say negative 26.2 kilojoules per mole, okay, um, 
and again, that is the standard enthalpy change, assuming the pressure of that N2 gas is one bar. Okay. If the pressure of that N2 gas was not one bar, then the enthalpy change of that reaction might not be exactly the same thing as 26.2 kilojoules per Right. Um, and then often the standard enthalpy reactions and things like that are given in terms of per molar quantities. Okay, so just keep that in mind, right? Um, okay. And again, as a reminder, right, for enthalpy, we define an exothermic reaction as one where the enthalpy change is less than zero, okay? And an endothermic reaction where the enthalpy change is greater than zero, okay? Right. And you're positive and negative, right? Um, questions about that? Move this. Oh, any, any other questions so far? That means that your, the standard state doesn't depend on the actual temperature. So I could talk about what is the standard state of CO2 gas at room temperature? What's the standard state of CO2 gas at minus 30 Celsius, right? Um, what's the standard state at minus 200 Kelvin, right? Like, you know, so I can talk about the, the, or I guess there's no minus 200 Kelvin, now like 10 Kelvin. Yeah, I'm thinking like minus 200 Celsius, right? But, but um, right, so the standard state is, Right, the, what's changing is whenever you're talking about a standard state of something, right, is you're talking about what is its kind of stable form at that given temperature, okay? So like for chlorine gas, its standard state at a different temperature, it could be in a gas phase, could be in a liquid phase, could be a solid, right? Um, and so that's kind of what changes between the standard state at different temperatures for certain substances is, is what phase is it actually naturally in at that temperature. Um, and for chemical reactions, as we'll, we'll talk about um, potentially today, right, the enthalpy change of these reactions, right, the standard enthalpy changes might not actually be the same at different temperatures, okay, and they could change, and we'll talk about how they change um, in a little bit. So other questions about kind of this definition of standard states, definition of enthalpy, exothermic, endothermic, Right, so as, as again, as I kind of alluded to earlier, right, um, because enthalpy is a state function, um, it, 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 um, we can use kind of this, this Hess's law, okay, I've talked about before, where let's say I have some set of reactants in state one here, and some final set of products in state four, right, where I get to those, by doing some reaction from state one to state two, some chemical reactions from state two to state three, some chemical reaction from state three to state four, right? Hess's law states that the enthalpy change from state one to state four is the exact same thing as the sum of all of these enthalpy changes from one to two, two to three, three to four, okay? Right, and again, that works because all Hess's law is just saying is it doesn't matter how I got from state one to four, the enthalpy change is always the same. So if I went from one to four directly, I would get this delta H14, right? But if I did it indirectly through these other chemical reactions, my total enthalpy change would be the sum of the enthalpy changes of all those chemical reactions. And those things have to be the same because again, they both start and end at the same point, okay? And so that's all Hess's law is getting at. That's all Hess's law uses. Okay, is it really is just saying, it doesn't matter how I get to my reactants and products, enthalpy change is the same always. So if I have some way of getting to my reactants and products that I know how to calculate the enthalpy change, then I can use that path to then calculate the enthalpy change from directly from those reactants to those products, okay? Right, 
And so we can use that, the idea of Hess's law and things like that um, to, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, to, to basically, you know, get to these type of formulas that maybe you use in general chemistry and PCAM and things like that, right? Where you're calculating some enthalpy change of some reaction at standard states, and you use the enthalpy of formation of, you know, products minus reactants and things like that, and you got to look up those enthalpy of formations and tables, multiply by stoichiometric coefficients, right? Um, hopefully that sounds familiar. We'll, we'll come back to this in a second, right? But, but you know, the, the, these formulas here that, you know, may or may not look familiar to you, okay, um, are all just based off of this basic idea of Hess's law that, listen, you know, it doesn't matter how I get to my reactants products, the enthalpy change is always the same as long as, I, as long as I start with the same reactants and at the same product. All right, um, and so how do we use Hess's law? Well, we need to, to get our desired reaction as some sum of other chemical reactions, right? Um, okay, now we might need to modify the chemical reactions that we're using to get to our final chemical reaction by, by flipping the direction of a reaction or multiplying by some stoichiometric coefficient and things like that. And when we do that, we need to modify the delta H's, enthalpies for those reactions, okay? And then to get the final enthalpy of reaction, okay, for the overall chemical reaction from the initial products, or initial reactants to final products, we just add up the enthalpy changes, right? We just, we just do this. We get add up the enthalpy changes of all the subsequent reactions to add up to give us our total chemical reaction. Let's talk about an example of that. So let's say, Right, this is the reaction I'm interested in, okay, um, right? Let's say I didn't know what that enthalpy change was, right? And I just like, hey, what is the enthalpy change for this chemical reaction, okay? Well, if I happen to know the enthalpy change for this reaction here, N2 plus O2 going to 2NO, and then 2NO plus O2 going to 2NO2, okay? If I knew the enthalpy changes for these two reactions, I see that if I add them up, this 2NO cancels, right? And I'm just left with the overall chemical reaction N2 plus 2O2 going to 2NO2, which is the above reaction that we want. And so to get the enthalpy change for this reaction, I would just sum up the enthalpy changes for these two reactions, which is 180 minus 112, okay? Which gives us a final value of 68 kilojoules, right, which is where that 68 kilojoules comes from. Um, let's see if I have another example. Uh, don't want to have one right, right here. Okay. But let's say, all right, I'm going to do an example just to remind people in case it's, it's been a while of how um, you manipulate these delta H's if you have to manipulate the chemical reaction, right? So let's say I want to know what is uh, I'm trying to think of some random chemical reaction here. Um, just making something up off the top of my head. Um, not being a actual chemist, but just a computational guy, you know, Coming up with chemical reactions is not as straightforward. Let's say this forms right, CL. I don't even think that molecule exists, but whatever. Nor my reaction is right. So, uh, Uh, 
Okay, so I'll do this example here that I've made up. Okay, just pretend, you know, this chemistry exists. Um, okay, so yeah, an issue one time last semester, my undergraduate PCHEM, I came up with some random chemical reaction. I think it was an electrochemical reaction. I had some sort of oxidation state for some element that doesn't actually exist, and it really threw everybody off. Uh, so again, I, you know, ignore anything that cannot physically actually occur. Let's just pretend it can, and, and given kind of the elements here, right? So, so our reaction here, we got N2O4 plus CO2 forming CO plus NO2 plus NO3. Okay. Um, it's this lovely, well-known uh, Shane reaction, um, right? Now, I don't know what the enthalpy change is for this reaction, right? But I happen to know that for the reaction NO2 plus NO2 going to N2O4, that has an enthalpy change of 100 kilojoules, okay? Um, and then I know for the reaction 2NO2 plus 2CO2 going to 2CO plus 2NO3, that has an enthalpy change of minus 50 kilojoules. And so the question is, is what is the final enthalpy change for this overall reaction up here? Right, and so to solve this problem, the first thing we need to think about is how can I construct this first reaction from my individual reactions down below? And so my first question is, is that first reaction that, 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 that I'll call this reaction one here, reaction two, if you will, right? So reaction one, do I need to do anything to it in order to sum it up with reaction two to get my final overall total chemical reaction? Yeah, I need to flip, right? Same, same the flips signal here, right? Not flipping me off, but you know, the, the turn signal, if you will. Right, so we need to flip it, right? We got to flip reaction one to form N2O4 going to NO2 plus NO2, right? We got to flip that reaction one because, right, N2O4 is in the reactant side, so I need N2O4 in the reactant side. Okay? So I got to flip that. What does that do to the enthalpy change for this chemical reaction? Then? Right, changes it to a negative, right? Flip the reaction. Multiply by negative one, right? Flip the sign, okay? Now, what about that some second chemical reaction? Do I need to do anything to it in order to get the final chemical reaction? Yeah, so we need to divide it by two. So, so the reactants and products are all in the right place, right? But I'm forming, say, two CO2, and I only want one CO, or sorry, two CO, and I want one CO, right? Two NO3, I only want one NO3. So, yeah, so I get to divide this by two, right? So flip, and then we'll say multiply by one half, right? In order to get NO2 plus CO2 yielding CO plus NO3. And what will the enthalpy change be for that reaction if I have to divide the stoichiometric coefficients by a half? Yeah, it will be minus 25, right? It doesn't change the sign, but I need to multiply my enthalpy by the same number as I multiply by my stoichiometric coefficient. So I multiply by half, so I can multiply 50 by a half, which gives me minus 25, right? So for my overall chemical reaction up here, right, delta H is just equal to minus 100 plus negative 25. So minus 125 kilojoules. Okay. Any questions about that uh, example here? All right, um, so related with all of this, 
Um, standard states, also the standard molar enthalpy formation reactions. Okay. Um, so, right, we have the standard enthalpy changes, right? The standard enthalpy of formation for some reaction is, is related with the enthalpy of formation reaction. So, so enthalpy, or sorry, not enthalpy formation reaction, formation reaction. So, there are standard formation reactions for any molecule, any compound, okay? Um, and the rules that apply to these is that there is, for these formation reactions, right, the, the, the the name of the reaction is a formation reaction, right? It's forming something. So you've got to form just one specific thing, okay? That one specific thing has to have a stoichiometric coefficient of one, okay? So, so one mole or one stoichiometric coefficient for the product, it's just a single product, it's got a stoichiometric coefficient of one. All reactants for these formation reactions are their pure elements in their standard states. So again, that, that's carbon would be a solid, right? F Fluorine would be F2 gas, okay? Oxygen would be O2 gas, right? Iron would be iron solid, things like that, right? Are there are elements in their standard states, assuming, say, room temperature. Again, the temperature could be different. The standard states could be different depending on the temperature, okay? And then you gotta make sure your reaction is balanced, okay? And so, for example, the, the formation reaction for H2O liquid is one half O2 gas plus H2 gas forming H2O liquid. Again, I need to make sure the stoichiometric coefficient here is one. I only have this one product, right? And then the reactants are elements in their standard states, which the standard state of hydrogen and oxygen are these diatomic gases, okay? So that's again, one half O2 gas plus H2 gas forming H2O liquid. So the enthalpy change for this reaction is referred to as the enthalpy of formation of H2O, okay? And so, right, so often when you're looking up, you know, these enthalpies in, in tables, right, and there are these form enthalpy formation tables, right, those enthalpies are, again, are referring to these specific type of chemical reactions, these formation reactions, okay? Um, right, and these enthalpy of formations are equal to zero in specific cases of what? When, when, when would that, Enthalpy formation be equal to zero. What would you? What 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 is the enthalpy formation of say O two? Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be zero, right? Because again, the formation reaction for O two gas would just be O two gas going to O two gas, right? There is no reaction. There's nothing going on. So that's why enthalpy of formation is equal to zero because the, the, the formation reaction is literally no reaction, right? And so that's why elements in their pure states have enthalpy formations of zero, okay? H2 gas, O2 gas, carbon solid, right? Iron solid, right? Sodium solid, right? Any pure element in its standard state, its enthalpy of formation is equal to zero because its formation reaction is no net reaction. It's just that element going to that element, right? With no change, okay? So that's why it's got an enthalpy formation of zero. All right. Um, so the note for enthalpy formations. Um, there, there is no kind of real reference point and so often we define the enthalpy formations of aqueous ions based off of saying that the enthalpy formation of H plus at one molar, right? So these are standard states, right? So there's not your standard state. So one molar H plus ions aqueous has an enthalpy formation defined as zero. And that is just defined that way so that we can have a reference for the enthalpy of formations for other ions in solution. So that's only specific to aqueous ions in solution, okay? Is that, that this entity of formation of H naught is used as the reference, okay? Um, right, uh, and so yeah. Questions about enthalpy of formation? Find that, right? And so the idea is, is based off of these enthalpy of formations and the concept behind Hess's law, 
If you know the enthalpy of formations of your reactants and products, you can directly calculate the overall enthalpy change of that reaction, okay? Based off of this, this equation here where, where these V sub i's are your stoichiometric coefficients in your chemical reaction, okay? And so it's the enthalpy of formation of your products minus that of your reactants multiplied by their stoichiometric coefficients will give you the overall enthalpy change for a chemical reaction. And so again, this is, is hopefully something that maybe you've done before in, you know, some sort of, um, uh, you know, gen chem class or things like that. But again, if it's not familiar, okay, um, right? An example of that would be say for this reaction, O2 plus 2CO going to 2CO2, right? The overall enthalpy change for that reaction can be written as the enthalpy of formation of CO2 times two right, because it's stoichiometric coefficient of two here, minus the enthalpy of formation of the reactants, which is the enthalpy of formation of O2 times stoichiometric coefficient of one, minus the enthalpy of formation of CO times its stoichiometric coefficient of two, right? And so then I would look up in a table what these stoichiometric coefficients are, right? Or not, sorry, not these stoichiometric coefficients. I look up in the table what the enthalpy of formations are for CO2 and CO, right? Enthalpy formation of O2 is zero, don't even need to look that up, right? But I look up the enthalpy of formation of CO2 and CO, and that information will then give me what is the enthalpy of the overall chemical reaction that I'm concerned about. Okay? And so this, you know, Hess's law and this, right, are, are kind of the two main ways without directly measuring the enthalpy of change of a reaction that you can calculate it beforehand, okay? Right? So in the lab, right, you either might if you're curious about what is the enthalpy change for this reaction, um, right? You're, you're either, um, you know, uh, going to measure it in lab, right? Through some calorimetry study, okay? Or you're gonna try to calculate it by looking up enthalpy formations of reactants and products if that information is available, or use enthalpy of, of other reactions that add up to give the overall reaction that you want, okay? Are kind of the three approaches that one can take to get the enthalpy change for a given chemical reaction. Okay. Questions? Right. Um, so here I have an example kind of Hess's law, right? Um, work over for a minute and then we'll kind of go over this together okay. where um, we're looking at right this overall chemical reaction given above and then given the enthalpies of these reactions down below right um, what is the overall enthalpy change for that chemical reaction
So, right, <clears throat> we want to get that final chemical reaction, right, from the ones given, right? The, we need to just kind of look at things that we need in our final reaction, right? And so I like to, you know, start with, say, the most complicated molecule and, and work from there. So I need this B2H6 as a product. All right, so I got to find here, okay, reaction two has B2H6 in it, but it says the reactant. So I know I'm going to need to flip reaction two. Okay, so um, Jennifer here got 36 cool joules. Oh. Uh, um, I don't know if anyone else got a similar number. Six. All right. Um, right, so we got to flip reaction two, right, to get. B2H6 as a product, okay? But when we do that, we're gonna be putting this B2O3 here as a reactant. So I gotta get rid of that. Luckily that's in reaction one. And they both have stoichiometric coefficients of one. So that works out fine. And then you notice you have H2 gas here. When you wanna change H2 gas um, to H2 liquid and then get rid of H2 liquid with reactions two, three and four. And if you do that, you'll end up with the correct bonds and hydrogen. So basically, right, some of some of the changes we need to do, right, we need to flip reaction two, okay, so, which reverses the sign of the H. And then reaction three, you had to multiply it by three, um, okay, in order to get three waters here, three liquid waters. And then reaction four um, is supposed to be multiplied by three as, four, as well. So. So reaction four should then multiply by three, multiply that number by three, okay? Because um, then H2O gas cancels with that H2O gas and then the H2O liquid cancels with that H2O liquid. So when you add everything up after you multiply reaction four by three, you'll get the final chemical reaction you want above, okay? And so when you do that, you get the final value of 36 kilojoules. Questions about this example? Anyone want to go through in more detail about how things cancel and such? Why we did what we did? Um, I think for the sake of time, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the temperature dependence of delta H and Kirchhoff's law next time. Um, yeah, so, so kind of right thermochemistry, just to give you an idea of kind of where we're going. Next time, we'll kind of finish up some of this discussion of enthalpy with just talking about how enthalpy can change with temperature with this uh, Kirchhoff's law. Okay. Um, we'll do an example of that. And then we'll start talking about entropy and kind of the basic concepts and ideas behind entropy. Um, and then we'll talk about Gibbs free energy and some of the basic concepts and ideas of that. And then we'll start talking about phase equilibrium and chemical equilibrium um, and then electric chemistry. Okay. So um, next time we'll, we'll again do this uh, Kirchhoff's law stuff, talking about the temperature dependence of enthalpy. And we'll, I'm sure, get the entropy and Gibbs free energy. Probably start talking some about equilibrium on Monday, um, and then Friday we'll we'll likely finish up our discussion of equilibrium and talk about electrochemistry. And again, we'll see. Maybe maybe we'll need a little bit more time than, than those days to talk about thermodynamics and not. But, um, but yeah, there there's not. Yeah, thermodynamics is definitely kind of the smallest little section bit. I want to focus on in this class compared to some of the other topics. But. So, any questions about things we've gone over today? Um, about the course in general, expectations, things like that. Again, for those, if, if there are any of those who, who wish to take the course purely online, I know uh, that there's already been one student who's expressed such. Um, you're welcome to do so. If for some reason you can't make it in one day and just want to attend the Zoom meeting, that's fine. I'm not, you know, you don't need to email me beforehand. The main thing is, is if you're wanting to take exams online, turn in homeworks online, things like that, I just need to know beforehand because 
Um, I, I create like online only sections and online only assignments and things like that. Um, they're not different from the in-person assignments, but uh, I just assign to only those students who are taking the thing online. So then on your Canvas gradebook, you don't have some zero for exam two, right? Because you took it in person, but then it says, oh, your, your exam two is grade zero, um, when in fact that's for like the online students, right? Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the main thing I just need to know as to whether or not um, you be taking homeworks or exams, you know, doing those things online. Otherwise, you know, in terms of regular lectures, you know, I don't take any daily attendance or things like that um, right now because of, uh, you know, all this COVID protocols and crap like that. Um, you know, and, and so, yeah, so the, in terms of that, you're just show up, happy to have you show up, attend online, happy to show online, want to watch the video, whatever works for you, you know, it, it's, it's not going to offend me. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully right here is what you have for the final coefficients for all of the reactions once you've multiplied and put them here. I don't know if that these look familiar, one, two, three, four. So oxygen, you should have three halves O2 in the first reaction, three halves O2 in the third reaction on the reactant side, and then you should have three O2 in the product. I took the second reaction and added the first and the second. Then the value of the oxygen is minus three O2. Yeah, so that would put it in the kind of reactant side, if you will, oh. right? You're, you're, the three halves here in the reactants canceled with only, or sorry. Uh, oh, so you, yeah, so I'm not sure. So, right, did you fl you flipped reaction two and had these two reactions here, yes. right? Yes. And then you added those together? Yes. All right, so when you add those together, you should get three halves here, canceling okay. with like three of the halves over here to have just three halves left on the product side. Um, so, yeah, it'd be three minus three halves if you know how you can get that. Um, but, yeah, hopefully. I'm happy to kind of uh, look over your work um, and, and kind of see how you did it to see what's going on. But any other or other questions? Oh, well, that is it for today then. Um, and again, I'll see you guys on Monday.